then let us call ourselves to worship. It is a good and blessed thing to come together, to be together, to sing, to pray, to hear the word, to reflect about what it means to be the people of God, what it means to be a household of faith. I call us now to the worship of our Lord God. Call us together so that we can remember why we come together, whose we are, and what we are to be about. Thank God for this time. service we always include a children's sermon. We know that we don't have little ones here with us this morning but we always pray that as our service is broadcast on YouTube later in the day or tomorrow morning that there will be children among the many who sign on for that service and so we always include one. Today I was going to speak about water in the early service 
and we had someone with us who hasn't been able to be with us for a long time. One of our members had knee surgery, and for the first time since September, has been here for worship with us. And we had some little ones with us this morning who haven't been with us for a long time. And I felt that the message that I needed to share with our children today is, we think about you all the time, whether you're here or whether you're not here. If you come one Sunday and we don't see a person for three months, that person remains on our hearts. If we are truly a household of faith, we are never absent from each other in the way God calls us to care for each other. We call that being present to each other in the spirit. Now, kids, that's a, that's a hard concept to get. But it will grow on you as you grow in life. You will come to know and understand and appreciate both by knowing that when you're not with a person, they think of you, and by knowing that when you're not with someone, you think of them. There is very little that has moved me as much as a pastor as when someone says to me, oh, I pray for you and your family every day. Wow. That's such an incredible thing to think about. We don't see each other every day. We don't talk with each other every day. But when someone says to me, oh, Pastor Kathy, I pray for you and your family every day. I understand why being part of a church, what we call here household of faith, gives us. So to our youngest, some of whom who might be worshiping with us through the YouTube video, we may never know, may never see in person. Children, I want you to know that doesn't matter. You're in our hearts. For those of you who are part of our household who we know, whether we have seen you lately or not, we care about you. You are part of who we are. We think about you. For those who have needed to be away because of illness or because of aging, it's important, children, that we always reassure everyone that we remember, that we hold in our memory those who cannot be with us all the time, for whatever reason that may be. And so kids, as you grow, there may be times in your life where you don't go to church very often. Your church holds you in prayer. There may be times in your life when things are just tough and you don't know how to get on, how to move forward. Your church will hold you in prayer. Because when we pray for the family of God, we pray for everyone. I pray that in your lifetimes, you will come to know this and recognize this. Because believe me, there will be times when that idea, that thought, that knowledge, knowing that will help you get through. But kids, here's the other thing. You can think of others. You can be present through God's love to others. You can hold others up in prayer, whether they're part of your church community or part of a larger community. That is a very special thing that we do for each other. And thanks be to God that he gave us that gift of presence with each other. Let's pray. Lord, for all the young people whose lives have touched this household of faith, we pray. For all of the children around the world who are our brothers and sisters in Christ, we pray. We are grateful for them. We hold them as family. Please help them to know that they are in our thoughts near or far away. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is a good and blessed gift to give back to the God who gives us so very much. So as we sing, let your spirit come, let us be thinking at the same time of the things that we will give to God in this week. In this household, we certainly acknowledge 
gifts from our wallets, from our resources. But that is only a part of what we are called to give. We acknowledge with clarity the gifts that we give of our hands, our feet, our hearts, our minds, the gifts that we offer in service. Let's take some time to consider what we will give back to God in this week. Let's pray. Lord our God, we ask your blessing upon the gifts that we bring to you this day. We ask that you will find them worthy. Through all that we do in your name, may we find ways in which to lift the family of God up, to help to heal, to be present, to share your love unconditionally as you share yours with us. To share all that we are in your name and in your service. For this we pray. Amen. PJ, we have Spirit of the Living God, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. Why don't I read the scripture first and then we'll sing? How's that? Sure. All right. Our scripture today comes from the third chapter of Matthew, verses 13 through 17. 
for today is the day in which we celebrate the baptism of our Lord. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. All right, BJ. words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts as we lift them up to you this day be acceptable in your sight our rock and our redeemer amen in the time in which our gospels begin the people of israel a people for whom the words of the prophets were essential in interpreting their history had not heard a word from a prophet for over 400 years. Into this time was born John the Baptist, John born of Zechariah and Elizabeth, contemporary of Jesus, kinsmen through their mothers came to prepare the way for the greatest fulfillment of prophecy in all history. The story of John's birth is told only in Luke chapter one, even before the telling of the story of the angel's visit to Mary, for John was the preparer of the way. John's parents are described in Luke as righteous people. Hear Luke's words. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah 
to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, what does it mean to be righteous, to walk in righteousness? It certainly doesn't mean to be right, not as we humans so desperately and so often want to be right. To walk in righteousness is to walk with God, to be right with God, focused and intent on being what God calls us to be. To walk in righteousness is to seek the path God ordains for us. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous people, seeking the will of God and living in accordance with God's ways. To such as these was born the little one who would prepare the way of our Lord. How many did John baptize in the River Jordan? We'll never know. Baptism was not invented by John. Baptism was not invented by Christians. Baptism was practiced in Judaism, but only for those who came to Judaism from other faiths. Baptism was not considered necessary for one who was born Jewish. It was in the bloodline. I wish we knew more about John and the path he took in understanding who he was called to be by God. Matthew gives us the best description of this extraordinary man. Let me just share a little bit. John appeared in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. He wore clothing of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. When he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, what he said to them was, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath of God? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. These are such as the strong and powerful words of John the Baptist, the image that we often have of him. John's ministry called people to repentance, to an acknowledgement of a deep need for God and returning to the Creator. He warned the Pharisees and the Sadducees that their birthright right alone was not enough to claim them for God, that their actions and the ways in which they choose would reveal their walk with God, not a line on a birth certificate. They needed God. They needed to be recalled. To righteousness. What are your thoughts on John the Baptist? How do you picture this wild man eating locusts and wild honey, shouting for people to repent? A little bit of a wild man, right? And yet, he's something of both because God told Zechariah that he would be a joy and a delight to Zechariah and Elizabeth, and many would rejoice because of his birth, for he would be great in the sight of the Lord. This wild man fitting the very description of Elijah was born into a world desperately in need of returning to God. One commentator writes that it was the Jewish belief that Elijah would return before the Messiah came and that he would be the herald of the coming king. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. That is part of a prophecy from Malachi, the book of Malachi. John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. That is the very description of the raiment which Elijah had worn. It's recorded in 2 Kings. Heralding prophecy fulfillment in the Messiah while living the prophecy of one who came to prepare the way. Born of righteous parents called by God to prepare the world for the Messiah, this John bears witness to God's very compassion and love for us. 
Some might see in him only words of dryer, peril, and threat. Repent! But what is repentance but a turning back to God? A call to repentance, but God calling us home. A return to a walk in righteousness, seeking to be right with the Creator. Right repentance, both the calling for it and the doing of it, are acts of love and compassion, initiated by a God who throughout history has called his people home. John's very act of calling people to repentance gave to them possibilities of joy and delight. Into the River Jordan, Jesus walked to be baptized by John. Hard for John to accept, but necessary for God's plan. For Jesus said to him, let us do this in honoring the fulfillment of righteousness. Upon the waters of the River Jordan, God poured blessing as the dove descended and God spoke. After Jesus had been baptized, he came up immediately from the water, the scripture tells us. And lo, the water, heavens were open for John, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. And lo, it bears hearing again, there came a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son, the Beloved One, in whom I am well pleased. God's words named Jesus for who he was. God's words blessed John, who so righteously spoke God's word and walked in God's ways. When we who were baptized as infants remember our baptism, we don't remember the actual event or who was there unless someone has told us or we have a picture. I can very clearly remember my first class in college, eight o'clock in the morning, introduction to the Old Testament. I sat through the whole class and at the very end, a young woman in front of me turned around and said, hi, you're Kathy, right? Yes. She said, I'm Susan Smith. My dad baptized us together when we were a year old. Now I have a picture of that day. I don't remember a thing about it, of course. I remember the picture. I remember what my family said to me about it. And lo and behold, 16 or 17 years later, I'm sitting behind a young woman with whom I had been baptized, whose father was a celebrant of the sacrament. I'll always remember that. And I remember four years later, when Susan and I stood with her dad and had our picture taken again together. It was a very special time indeed. I'm grateful for those memories. I don't remember it. I gave my son Camilo a birthday card once that said, a day you will never remember, a day I will never forget. Somehow, for those of us who were baptized as infants, I wonder if God bears that thought for us. Now, let me ask you, are there any here today who were baptized as an adult? Lori, anyone else? Lori, do you have clear memory? Yeah, I was 16. You were 16? I would love to talk to you about that sometime, what that day meant to you and what specifically you remember about it. We had one in the first service as well who was baptized at 10 and clearly remembers. But whether baptized as an adult or infant, when we remember our baptism, we are called to remember, and I use this phrase all the time, you know it, we are called to remember whose we are and why we are here. I think just those two thoughts could solve the majority of problems on our earth. If we would just remember whose we are, and why we are here. That's what baptism says to us. We are called to walk in the way of God's righteousness. We are called to prepare the way for the Messiah in the hearts of others. Often, we are called to recall that way in ourselves when the world takes hold of us and leads us astray. 
Jesus came to the River Jordan to be baptized by John to show us the way to God's heart. Baptism finds its power in God's love for God's people. I served a community once in which new parents would ask me when they could get their child done. <laughs> yeah, I remember the first time someone came and said, Reverend Kathy, my son's two months old. When can I get him done? And I was at a loss, totally at sea. And one of my members came up and said, I'm being baptized. I'm, Thank you. When can I get my child done? Done could have meant many things. Perhaps the choice of word rested in the fear that a child might die without being done, without being complete, fully blessed by God and therefore ready for heaven. How often has we sinned as a church by motivating others to get done out of fear of a damning God? God's baptism isn't a shield from wrath, but a doorway to the most incredible love we could ever know. The love of a God who loves us still, no matter how many times we have stepped off the path of righteousness, no matter how many times we have turned away. Baptism claims us as beloved children of God, and so Jesus allowed himself, who did not need it, to be claimed, to be named God's beloved son. Remembering our baptism calls us back no matter how many times we need to be reminded that we are capable of a righteousness that prepares others to know God's love through us. We tend to focus on the sin and darkness. Well, there's drama in it, isn't there? We are certainly capable of great sin. And not just the variety that lands one in a human jail, but the more ordinary daily sins of forgetting whose we are and why we are here that land us in a spiritual jail of our own making. Baptism, I do not believe, begins and ends with sin. I believe baptism begins and ends with the love of a God who calls us to so much more and who helps us to learn to live a life apart from sin. One of my favorite commentators wrote some words about this passage, and I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. He talks about how John urgently summoned us to righteousness. John's message was not just a negative denunciation. It was a positive erecting of the moral standards of God. John not only denounced the sins that we have committed, but summons us to what we ought to do. He not only condemned for the ways in which we've fallen short, but challenged us by what we can be. John was like a voice calling us to higher things. He not only rebuked evil, he also set before us the good the compassionate love of our God. Thanks be to God for a Messiah who in so many ways embraced us, called us, healed us, redeemed us. Thanks be to God for the one who prepared the way. Amen. as we join together in the Sacrament of Communion today. We're doing something a little bit different. One of our members has heard how difficult it can be sometimes to use the pre-filled cups as we've had them. Uh, we had the ones where you tear off the paper on the lid and it goes <laughs> just like that, right? Is that pretty good? That wasn't bad. And also the ones that sometimes turn sour <laughs> if they get kept too long. Someone told me once you should check the dates on those pre-filled cups and I said, don't need to. I watch my parishioner's face and that tells me all I need to know. <laughs> so these are fresh. The bread that we have with which to commune is freshly baked by a member of the household. 
And the cups make a little noise coming off, but it's not that raucous noise that can fill a quiet sanctuary. So we're trying something a little new today. For those of you who are, are new to us or fairly new, we normally have communion on the first Sunday. But I wasn't prepared for 25 coming out on January 1st last week. I guess we're just not partiers. So I planned it for this Sunday instead. Our United Methodist Church has written beautiful liturgies for communion for special holidays, holy days, occasions. And I'd like to use some of the words of this one that was written especially for the time of Epiphany and for the baptism of the Lord. I'm going to ask you to get a hymnal out and turn to page 13 so that we can share in the responses together. Page 13. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth or you had formed the earth from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have revealed yourself our light and our salvation. You sent a star to guide wise men to where the Christ was born. And in your signs and witnesses in every age and through all the world, you have led your people from far places to his light. In his baptism and in table fellowship, he took his place with sinners. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim releasing to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. If you would hold your cups up, please. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. You may commune as you are ready.
Join me in offering our thanks to God. Lord our God, we are so deeply grateful for this meal, a meal which sustains us as no other possibly could. As it courses through our veins, may that which you have given us this day empower us, embolden us, strengthen us, heal us, redeem us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would like to, as we begin a time of lifting up our joys and concerns, offer an unspoken need for one of our household. I would also like to ask your prayers for the family of Terry Pleckel. I told you last week that I received word on Christmas Eve, along with many from my former church, Little Hill, that Terry had gone missing. She's been suffering from dementia for six months, and she left her home in the middle of the night on Christmas Eve in that bitter, bitter cold with no coat, no cane. And uh, they did find her the next morning. Uh, she had been out all night in that cold. And her service was yesterday, so I would like to ask prayer for the family of Terry Pleckel and prayer for the family of Barry Coleman, sister of one of my best friends who died of cancer two days ago. What are your prayer concerns today? Patty? Um, I talked about Kuti last week. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to talk. Joy, he came home from the hospital yesterday Good. and is doing much better. He's Wonderful. Going through rehab still. Um, he's learning to walk again. So Kugi, for whom we prayed last week, we're lifting up a joy today that he's come home from the hospital and is going through rehab to learn to walk again. We'll pray him through. Please pray for our friend Eddie who is dealing with cancer. Eddie. And BJ, how was your friend who had the serious, serious heart attack? Uh, better. Oh, good. Good, good. Remind me of his first name, please. Grant. Thank you. Grant. Lisa. Uh, prayers for... Um family of John. He had a medical emergency at work and also for his colleagues. Um, they came to his aid. He was hospitalized um, and unfortunately passed away. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you say he, while he was at Frick he had a... Uh, oh, at work. At work. So we will pray for his family. Patty. Also my friend Dory. She yes. She has lupus. Right. And has not caught um, dementia. No. I'm sorry to hear that. Rich. Okay. Rich. Pray for people who I know who've had surgery for hips and joints for healing. And also pray for families that have children that should, their parents should be bringing them to the church. The, that the parents will bring them? Yeah, that they need to be in church. Okay. So we're praying for people who have had, had joint replacement surgeries or some kind of joint surgery, as well as praying for families with children that they will have a heart to bring them to church. Okay. okay. Thank you. 
pray together. Oh Lord, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face, and I know they feel the presence of the Lord's sweet Holy Spirit. Sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for these blessings, we lift our hearts in praise. Without a doubt, we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. Lord our God, there is a sweetness in this place, and not that saccharine sweetness that fills so many of the things we eat, but a precious and abiding sweetness that truly feeds us. When we bow to you in prayer, we acknowledge that sweet presence. We know that we are welcome at the foot of your mercy seat. We know that what we bear in our hearts, you already know, and yet you welcome our prayers, our words, our participation in lifting up your creation to you. There is a sweetness here that sustains us, that heals us, that redeems us. Lord, you've heard the names that we've lifted up. You know every concern that we bear upon our hearts, and we know that you call us to pray for those who are near and dear to us, for friends and neighbors, for friends of friends for whom we have been asked to lift up a word. But you also call us to pray for our brothers and sisters throughout the world, to pray for our very world. We pray for people we may never know, whose names we can't pronounce. Sometimes for people we don't even like. Sometimes for people with whom we vehemently disagree. You call us to pray for our dearest loves in life. Those who we have come to know and upon whom we have come to depend. You call us to pray. You call us to pray. The gift that you have given to us in prayer is sweet indeed. We pray for our world, Lord. We pray that all will know you and know of your unconditional love. And we pray that all of us will reflect that love in the midst of where we are so that the ripples of the love we express unconditionally for all of our brothers and sisters will reach throughout the world. We pray for those who are in pain, who hurt for whatever reason. May your balm be there for them. We pray for those who are angry May your peace fall upon them. We pray for those who are hungry. May your justice be fulfilled in their lives. We pray for those who have sinned and who hurt deeply and we seek your mercy. We pray for anyone and everyone who simply needs a reminder of your love for them. We seek your grace. And we know in our hearts that you hear us. We know in our hearts that you are with each one of us. On this day in which we celebrate the baptism of the Lord, we use these words from the Book of Common Prayer, Lord in heaven. At the baptism of Jesus in the River Jordan, you proclaimed him, your beloved son, and anointed him with the Holy Spirit Grant that all who are baptized into his name may keep the covenant they have made and boldly confess him as Lord and Savior, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns. We pray for those who are not baptized for whatever reason. We know that your love extends and extends and extends. Help ours to do the same. 
All of this we left up and ask in the name of our Lord who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Receive these words of blessing. Go now as a light to the nations. Preach what you know of the risen Christ and fulfill all righteousness. May God strengthen you and bless you with peace. May Christ Jesus bring forth justice for you and among you, and may the Holy Spirit alight on you and affirm you as God's beloved ones. We go this day in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen? A blessed week to all of you. Screwed up a part of that. You want to do it Yeah, can I just do it one more time? Just, just, I'm, just uh, I, I was trying to do something and I kind of lost the rhythm of it and it came out goofy. Okay.